Mm. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Judges, Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16. While you're turning, I just want to say thank you so much for the honor of this opportunity to share the Word of God here at Corinth Baptist Church. And I really appreciate your prayers and concern regarding our health. Five weeks ago yesterday, I woke up in my bed that morning not knowing I'd be laying on a surgical bed that night. And so I'm grateful to be here, and I appreciate your concern and your prayer so much, very much. Now, let's turn our attention to our scripture text this morning. We're not going to read it at this time. The entirety of our text, if you have the outline, is actually six, chapter 16, verses 19 through 25 and only in the 30. But we're looking at a man named Samson. Samson had so much potential, yet he squandered the majority of it due to his thick head and his thick heart. This man allowed his pride and his selfishness to lead to his downfall. The strongest man on earth, Samson, is now blind, broken, and disgraced. The Samson that the Philistines hated and once feared, he's now nothing more than a demeaning object for their entertainment. And guess what? Who could Samson blame? The person in the mirror. Samson could blame no one but himself. You see, Samson had been spiritually negligent, morally careless, and selfishly motivated. And this led to his downfall, his defeat. And literally the devil skint his head through the hands and scissors of a woman and her cohorts named Delilah. And maybe this morning you can identify with Samson. I'm not talking about the haircut though, okay? Maybe you can identify with Samson in a spiritual sense. Maybe you too at one time were stronger in the Lord, stronger for the Lord than you presently are, but something happened to you. You got distracted in life perhaps. Maybe you too became spiritually negligent or morally careless or you became selfishly motivated. And you too are sitting here this morning in the pew of a church and if you're honest with yourself, maybe some of us would have to say, you know what? I feel like I've been to the devil's barbershop in a spiritual sense, and I'm wondering, can my spiritual health, can my spiritual hair be restored? Well, I got a word of encouragement for you this morning, child of God, and this is primarily for those of us who are saved by the grace of God. Even though we are sons and daughters of the living God and we've been declared righteous and that's forever in the family, there are times that even children of God, we misstep, we step off the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We act out and show ourselves unlike him in our actions and attitudes and demeanor and our deportment and we have disobedience. So what is the answer? Well, here's a word of encouragement. The word of encouragement this morning as we'll learn in just a few moments from Samson is that there is hope for spiritual revival, spiritual renewal, spiritual restoration to the truly repentant child or people of God. Now notice if you would in Judges chapter 16, just verse 22, how bit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Now, I want you to please understand the most important thing was not what was happening physically by way of hair growth on Samson's head, even though that was happening. The most important thing was happening spiritually by way of his heart in his relationship with Almighty God because his hair never really was the source of his strength. And for that matter, the strength never was Samson's. It was God's to begin with. The hair was a symbol of the fellowship, not the substance of it. The hair, therefore, is a visible indicator of his fellowship with God that is being restored and it's once again growing. Verse 22 is therefore a small little minute verse, but my, 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 what a message it has. It has enormous implications that should instruct us and that should encourage us as well. As a matter of fact, our purpose this morning is to quickly consider, there are many we could consider, I want us to consider four life lessons from Samson that can apply to you and I as children of God. Four life lessons. Lesson number one, Samson's life reminds us that no matter how far we may fall in our spiritual experience, and by the way, we all fall. I hope I don't have to convince you that. We all fall at times as Christians. No matter how far we may fall in our spiritual experience, we never fall beyond the possibility of God's forgiveness and God's restoration. We see that Samson in his absolute weakness is reaching out to the Lord and the Lord reciprocates in grace. The Lord welcomes him back, accepts him back. Now we know this is not only true for Samson, but consider another example quickly. You remember King David? Remember David, that heart, right, that, that heart playing, psalm writing, giant slaying, man after God's own heart, anointed king of Israel. David, could not only did he commit adultery with Bathsheba, he had her husband murdered in order to cover up his selfish, sinful tracks. David was involved in a, in, a, in a string of horrible, sinful events. 
But when David finally got to the point, and we'll look at that in a moment, when David finally got to the point of genuinely being broken over his sin, repentant for his sin, and he calls upon God for forgiveness and restoration, immediately, immediately, David experienced happiness of God's forgiveness and the sweetness of his fellowship with God being restored. Just listen to the words of David, a man who's celebrating the grace of God. In Psalm 32, verse 1, David says, Blessed is he whose sins, whose transgressions have been forgiven, rather, whose sins are covered. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Not only David, but we know major spiritual failure occurred in the life of the apostle Peter. Matter of fact, there's at least two times in scripture that Peter messed up in a big way and he messed up in a public way. Now we usually think about the time when, when Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times at a time of our Lord's greatest need. Right after Peter just bragged and boasted that, that he, you know, he, he was not going to fail Jesus, though others might fail Jesus, because after all, Peter loved Jesus. He loved Jesus. He bragged about the fact that Jesus, others may leave you high and dry, but I'm going to stick with you through the thick and thin. I'll be with you all the way to the end. And if I have to die for you, then so be it, Jesus. Jesus, of course, prophesied over him and at him and about him and said, I'm telling you the truth. You're going to deny me three times. And that's what happened. The rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. Peter lied, denied knowing Jesus. Then, then he swore an oath second time that he didn't know Jesus. And the real kicker came when the apostle Peter Trust like a drunken sailor to make his point that I have no identification, no affiliation with this man, Jesus. But can I tell you something? Though he didn't act like it, Peter was a man who knew God. He was a man who we would say was saved. You say, what are you talking about? Well, remember the evening before, the evening of the rather, when Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples in the upper room. And when Peter's time comes in line, Peter at first resisted, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have no part with me. And then Peter, of course, he's always like me or like most of you. He's either both feet in or both feet running away. He says, well, fine, Lord, give me a bath while you're at it. And Jesus said, Peter, <laughs> you don't need a bath. You are already clean, but not all of you. This he spoke concerning the son of perdition, Judas Iscariot, whom he knew would betray him. He said, all you need, Peter, is for your feet to be washed. And you see what he was saying there is a wonderful word of encouragement for you and I as people of God in our failure, even as God's children. You say, what are you talking about? When he told Peter, he said, Peter, you don't need a bath. You are already clean. That's just another way of saying, Peter, you're already clean. You're already right spiritually before God Almighty. You only need your feet to be washed. And child of God this morning, can I tell you that if you're a son and daughter of the living God, that is not just for time. That's for all of eternity. Your present and your future, your status, your position, it is settled, it is fixed, it is secure. Can't nothing knock you out, shake you out. You can't crawl out of the grace grip of our God. Amen? You can't. You can't. You see, we're, we're, we've already been bathed. We've already been washed in the blood, we might would say. We're saved. We're positioned in our grace relationship with God. And we're made right with Him forever bathed. But we are contaminated at times as we go through life day by day, the contaminations of living in a sinful world. And sometimes even as children of God, we still make sinful choices. And so we need to daily confess our sins, have our feet washed. And Jesus has promised to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He did that for Peter. He not only forgave Peter, he restored Peter. He affirmed Peter's apostleship. And then he used Peter in a mighty way on the day of Pentecost at the birthing of the New Testament church. Peter sinned greatly, but he repented greatly. And God's grace was greatly expressed to him and through him. The Bible says Peter, after he realized what he'd done, he went to a private place where he wept bitterly. Again, he sinned greatly, he repented greatly, but God was great in his grace toward him. And as we think about restoration, I want you to turn quickly to Psalm 51, if you would. Psalm 51, verse 10 through 13. And let's think about the, the, the call to renewal in the life of King David with his repentance. I'm not going to wait for him to go ahead because of time. In Psalm 51, verse 10 through 13, it says this, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then, and anytime you see the word then in Scripture, ask the question, when? Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Now let's very informally walk back and casually look at and yet seriously receive what the Lord is saying through, through this man's repentant prayer. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God. 
David is basically saying, God, I messed up. Would you remove the stain? Would you take away the sin? Would you wipe the slate clean? Would you give me a new beginning? We've all been there, child of God. We've all been there. And then he says, and, and renew a right spirit within me. Uh, David was being honest. He said, I'm having a hard time staying focused and being faithful. And a right spirit means a loyal spirit, a faithful spirit. We're like that hymn writer that says, prone to wonder, prone to leave the God I love. And, and that's true of all of us, especially if our old nature still inside that battles against the new man or the new woman. And so he's praying that God will help him be faithful. God will help him be loyal. Then he says, cast out your Holy Spirit from me. And she be cast me not from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now, thank God we live in a better covenant, the new covenant. But he was under the old covenant. And, and in, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon individuals and then sometimes would leave and maybe come back, maybe not. And, and David, knowing about his sin and his disregard, his transgression, ball faced transgression in the face of the king, the, the king, not just him as a king, he said, God, please don't abandon me and please don't take your spirit from me. As children of God, can I tell you, that's never going to happen to you and I. He has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. Amen? He's promised that. And not only that, he has, he has indwelt you and I with the Holy Spirit of God. Matter of fact, if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, you're not saved. You don't really know Jesus. You might know about him, but you don't know him. The Bible says if any man has not the Spirit, he's none of his. And his Spirit bears witness of our spirit that we are the children of God. And so, so, so we don't have to worry about the Spirit of God being taken from us. Matter of fact, the Holy Spirit is the one who convicted us of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come, that convicted us, that courted us, that converted us, and that sealed us for eternity. That's what the Holy Spirit of God has done for you and me as children of God. And so we don't have to worry about that. It's not a fear. And then he says, restore to me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. And when he says, restore to me the joy, well, his joy had been sabotaged because of his selfish sins that he had not confessed and got right with God sooner. And the same thing had happened to you and I. You're not getting saved again because once you're saved, if you're truly saved, that's forever. You have a relationship that's intact forever. That's God's job to keep that intact. But you and I do have a portion, have a part, have a responsibility to maintain fellowship with the Lord. And when we disobey the Lord, we hinder that fellowship between us and God. And if we stay there long enough, we're going to produce some problems for ourselves and maybe even for other folks, okay? Uh, and so, so we see his joy was gone. And, and, and you and I have the same thing happen. Now, the Holy Spirit, again, won't be removed from us, but we can grieve the presence of the person of the Holy Spirit in our life through our disobedience. And if we remain in a state that we know we're not right with the Lord, but we're stubborn and we won't come around as submissive sons and daughters, we will move from grieving the Spirit to actually quenching the Spirit. And that's some serious stuff. And that would be another sermon another time. But the point is, undealt with, unconfessed sin on your part and my part as a child of God, it sabotages our fellowship which short circuits our joy of the Lord. And then he says, uphold me with thy free spirit. This is God's free spirit. It's his gracious spirit. So he's saying, basically, please continue to be gracious to me. Oh my, don't you want that in your life? Please be gracious to me. Here's the key verse, verse 13. Then, remember I told you when you, ask, when you see the question then? I mean, the word then, ask the question when? Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted. So then, when? In other words, when you have forgiven me, cleansed me, given me a new slate, a new beginning, help me have a faithful, loyal spirit, when you restore to me the joy of your salvation, and you're continuing to be gracious to me, then, when I have been restored, I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted. When you have restored me and forgiven me, Lord, I'll continue to offer my life in service to you, minister to others. I will speak, teach, preach. I will try to be used of you, God, as a vessel to, to have an impact on others for their good and for the glory of God. I will try to be an influence for you, Lord God. So use me, Lord. Now, I want you to understand this. This will bless your heart if you're saved today. And yet sometimes, you know, there are periodic times in your life and my life, we don't always act out who we are. This man is praying this entire prayer. Verse 13 is not an add-on or attack on after the fact. This is right in the middle after Nathan put his finger in his face and says, you the man, David's finally honest, finally broken, and he's asking for God to do all this forgiving, cleansing, and, and restoring. And in the midst of that, he says, then you'll use me again. So he has faith that not only will God forgive him, faith that God will not only cleanse him, faith that God will not only restore him, but faith that God will keep using him despite his former disobedience as a son or a child of God. Now, I say that to say this. You need to be encouraged because we have one that's trying to discourage us all the time. We have an enemy. We have an adversary of the devil who's roaming to and fro seeking whom he may devour. He's also the accuser of the brethren. He's the slanderer of the church. That's who he is. And, and, and the devil, when you mess up, you ever had this happen to you? You may not hear it audibly, but it's almost like you can. 
it's like in the back of your mind or in your heart, you hear this voice. God's not going to ever be able to use you again after you said what you said. God won't be able to use you again after you did what you did, buddy, by the way. And then the devil will match it up. He'll go a step higher. The devil will even sin, insinuate or suggest, you call yourself a Christian? Really? Come on now. You, you think you really say? You, 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 remember, you acted wrong. You said something wrong. You did something wrong. I mean, as if God's people never go astray. As if God's real people are sinless and perfect. Who ever heard of sheep going astray and a shepherd having to leave the rest to go pursue them to restore them? You know, I'm being facetious. That's a story testimony for every one of us before we got saved and even after we're saved as well. Now, God does not make light of our transgressions, please. He does not, I mean, it, it required a high price, the brutality of the body and the bloodshed and the life given of our Redeemer to take care of it once and forever, all right? He doesn't take lightly our sins, our transgressions, but we should not take lightly the grace of God that saved us to begin with, the grace of God that will restore us for us to continue with Him. And, and real, real quickly, side note as we move along, the other three points, trust me, they're not as lengthy. You're like, well, brother, you can you leave anything. I want to uh, talk to myself. The other three are not as long, but you listen to this. Listen, church. Satan is the accuser, brother. You and I, and I include myself, we're never more like the devil. We're never more like the devil than when we find fault with other people, when we gossip, when we slander the name and reputation of other folks. On the other hand, we're never more like Jesus than when we are willing to express grace and mercy and understanding towards others, even in the midst of fault. And I would say especially in the midst of fault, because that's where God found you and me, is in our fault. And yet he loved us. And if we're his children, guess what? It's supposed to be like daddy. It's supposed to be like Abba. It's supposed to be like father. Amen. Amen. Quickly, because of time. Lesson number two. Our God is a God who's in the business of restoring failures who trust Him. And that's good news for every one of us. Because if He was not a restoring God, we'd all be toast, burnt toast at that. We'd all be ruined. I mean, who among us never lets the Lord down? If you would stand, we want to recognize you. i got to sit in on that one because I know I don't qualify. We all fail. We all sin. We all mess up. We all misrepresent Him with our attitudes, our actions, our words, and our deeds. Periodically in our lives, every one of us do. But we need to go back to 1 John 1 9 when that happens from our hearts and say, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Child of God, this morning I want this to lift you up and propel you forward in your walk with God. By virtue of the finished work of Christ on the cross, you and I, we stand unconditionally, absolutely, completely, eternally accepted before Almighty God. Our sin's already been paid for. Our redemption's already been purchased. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're free. We're, we're free to live for God. But forgiveness needs to be understood in two dimensions, and Samson's experience teaches us a third lesson. Lesson number three. Even though forgiveness is immediate, restoration is gradual. You know, you can be forgiven by God like that in a moment. I mean, in a moment, he can forgive you. He can forgive you and I at a point in time. But our restoration, many times, it takes place in the process over time. It took time for the hair on Samson's head to grow back. More importantly than his hair, it took time for his heart to be transformed, his heart to be changed. When I sin, even though I'm saved, Periodically, which, you know, if you're sinning habitually, you're not a child of God, and neither am I. Third John teaches that. First John chapter 3, rather. But when we periodically, as true children of God, we periodically sin. And when I sin, the very moment, the very instance, I approach the Lord on the basis of 1 John 1 9, I am forgiven. I am forgiven. My fellowship, I've already been in relationship forever, but my fellowship is restored. I'm forgiven. But the process of the rest of my spiritual restoration may take time, especially depending on what I'm confessing and repenting of. This is very important. Church, I need you to hear this. If you're a child of God, you need to listen to this just for a few more minutes. Please, listen. When significant spiritual failure occurs in our lives as genuine believers, it's usually not a fluke. It's usually not the product of just a moment. Nearly almost always, significant spiritual failure is the result of a pattern a pattern of spiritual negligence and careless habits on our part that we've allowed to accumulate over time that has actually set, up, set the stage and brought out the props for our inevitable failure into sin. And it's no one's fault but 
ourselves. And those habits, not only do they need to be unlearned, repented of, but, the, but new, biblical, beneficial, godly habits must replace them. And, and listen, that process takes time. Let this statement just re reside in your heart, child of God. Restoration, restoration takes time through repentance, godly discipline, and wise choices. Now, our restoration certainly wouldn't happen apart from the grace of God, but our restoration also requires responsibility and accountability on our part as children of God. You see, the Lord's purpose is not just to forgive our past, though every one of us in this room that's saved, aren't you glad He forgives our past? Amen? And your past could be five minutes ago. Your past could be 50 years ago. I'm glad part of his purpose is to forgive our past. But that's not the complete purpose of God. It's not just to forgive our past. God's purpose of grace is also to guarantee our future. To guarantee our future growth and development. To guarantee our future fruitfulness for him. Our future faithfulness to him. And can I tell you, that kind of restoration doesn't happen a snap of a finger. It don't occur overnight. It takes time. It takes time. Fourth, final truth this morning we want to share with you. Samson's example shows us that the consequences of our sin not always erased this side of heaven. Not always done away with on here on earth. For example, Samson grew new hair, yeah, but he didn't receive new eyes, did he? I mean, the Philistines had... I don't know if they burned them out, poked them out, pulled them out. I don't know. They took them out regardless. The, they took them out because he made himself vulnerable to them. And when we finally repent of our sins, whatever that may be at your life, in your life or my life at that point, we're distant from the Lord. Understand this. God does not necessarily automatically obliterate, cancel, wipe out the past with all of its consequences and with all of its fallout. We still have to reap what we have sown, even though God can forgive us of our self-destructive harvest. I got a lead mint scar on my gut now. <laughs> I didn't have about two months ago, but I got one now. And uh, you know what? It's going to be there until I die, until Jesus says, come on up here, son. But now it's healing. But I'll live with that scar the rest of my life. And no matter what you and I may do in life as children of God, go in a time of disobedience, whether it be short term, longer term, or regardless of the fallout and damage, our God can forgive us. Oh my, thank God. And He can heal us. But sometimes we still have to live with consequences and we still have to live with scars. Let me give you an example or two. No amount of repenting, no amount of repenting could undo the birth of an illegitimate child like that between David and Bathsheba. David's repentance didn't bring Uriah back from the grave either. He still did. Also, David experienced negative effects in his, of the negative effects of his sin in his family life for the rest of his life to his dying day. Now, here's the balance. I want you to see this. We're going to close in just a few minutes. Listen, listen. David's guilt was gone. Hallelujah. Glory to God. His guilt was gone. His fellowship with God was just as sweet and restored as it ever had been. But David still had to deal with the ramifications of his sin until his death. Self-destructive choices. Really, let's tell you what it is. Self-sabotaging choices we make in life as children of God. They create damage. It's a great truth of Scripture. Our God, He restores failure. Otherwise, none of us, none of us would ever be used of God because we all fail in various ways to various degrees along the journey of life. Do we not? We all do. But here's the key. Here's the key I want you to understand. That even though God can forgive, He may not restore us to our original usefulness, as we mentioned before about the scars that may remain. Samson was blind, but he didn't get his eyes back. And, and he never again would be able to do what he could have done had he not been disobedient, had he not been stubborn, had he not been hard-headed, had he not been so full of himself that there was no room for God to work. Because of his sin, but he was truly completely forgiven. And the Lord had a great work for him to do. As we go to our invitation in just a moment, I want you to get this balance in your mind and your heart and let it bless you. Number one, 
We must never minimize the seriousness of our sin and its consequences. Don't you ever minimize it. None of it's light. On the other hand, may we never lose the reality of God's grace and God's forgiveness. Grace that's greater than all, last time I checked, all includes everything, than all of our sin. God did not give Samson his eyeballs back. But God did use Samson's blindness to enable Samson to do what he probably never would have been able to do. Had he been sighted, and that is bring down the enemy's house. You know good and well if Samson was physically healthy and vital and had his eyes and had his sight, the Philistines would have never allowed him to walk right in the midst of their Colosseum and stand between the two post of pillars that supported the whole building. You know why? Because he would have been immediately seen as a threat. But nobody's afraid of blind, broken, defeated, has been Samson. Nobody's afraid of him. He's a joke. I mean, he's just our entertainment to this evening, ladies and gentlemen. But can I tell you the wonderful truth, Christian, is this. The amazing truth of our glorious, gracious God is that God can take even the consequences of our sin and even our failures, and He can transform them into instruments of His glory. If we experience His forgiveness and express His grace, He will heal us and He will help us to continue to go forward in life. Here it is. Here it is. The good news is that God will forgive and restore any truly repentant child of God. And periodically, we all need to come to the altar. And I don't necessarily mean this one. Though if God wants you to come, you come. But the altar is where you meet you and, and Abba. You meet you and Father. You and Daddy. You and God, your Father. And you get things right again. You're not getting saved again. You're a child of God. But you're getting restored in fellowship. Even in your failure, He will not abandon you. If you're saved, then that's forever. However, if you're truly saved, I'm going to tell you this. You can't just sin and not leave it you know, not, not just leave it alone and not deal with it without being miserable. There's no way. You will be miserable until you get everything right once again between you and your Heavenly Father through honest confession, genuine repentance, glad submission, and godly choices. And then last of all, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't know Him as Abba. You don't know Him as Daddy. You might just know about Him as God religiously, but you don't have a grace relationship with Him like the rest of us, only by grace to have. Well, the invitation for you is to come to Jesus. And Jesus, he, He's your only solution because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of our sin, the payment, what we deserve for our sin is death, separation, alienation from God forever in a place that's not as far from pleasant, a place of punishment. But He paid the price. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And you don't work your way. He, he, he did the work at the cross and the resurrected tomb. Okay, We're saved by grace through faith. That not of ourselves is not a worst that any of us should boast. But he invites you to have a relationship that's personal, not just religious, about him, but a relationship with him through Jesus. He invites you to that. He invites you to enter into security in time and for eternity. He invites you to find a storm shelter for the wrath of God, the judgment of God that's coming on this world of ungodly and unbelief one day like a storm of vengeance. But you'll find shelter in the refuge of the Redeemer, Jesus. Brother Donald, you come. Instrumentalists come. Let's stand, congregation. You just respond to the Lord during this time. Maybe something's been said verbally that God has used to speak to your heart and mind and wanting you to do something about that either privately or publicly. But God's also big enough that even something that might have not been said verbally, He's still speaking beyond that. And he's speaking to you at your point of need, expressing his love and concern and his plans and purposes for you. Respond to him right now. What hymn are we going to sing? Because he lives 449. 449. Oh, 
love you.